is really exciting to be here tonight um, to be speaking in front of you. And like Pastor Jeff said, we've been here about three and a half years at New Hope and feel incredibly blessed that God has led us here. We are getting plugged in. We are loving getting building relationships. And when we were looking for a church home a few years ago, uh, we thought, we'll visit New Hope, but it's the furthest away, so probably not. And we came once, and we never left. So, <laughs> yeah, right? He's going to clap. Um, but I do want to say hello to Pastor Weaver, because he told me when I talked to him on Thursday before he left for Israel that I should say hi to him. Hello. Um, he's probably watching from Israel, and Pastor, we hope that you don't, like, miss the bus for anything and end up wandering in the wilderness. We want you to come home. So um, we're glad that you um, get to go on that experience. Um, it's fun to be able to be up here tonight, and um, it's a little daunting to be speaking about healthy families. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, what hinders and what helps us in healthy communication, especially when you're doing that in front of your family, because they're going to know if I'm practicing what I'm preaching, right? Exactly. Um, but in addition to what Pastor Jeff said, I tell people when I have new clients come into my office, I tell them I'm in my third career. I was a children's pastor for about 10 years at two different churches, and then I was home with my kids for about 10 years. That was the absolute most rewarding and hardest job in the entire world. And um, now I'm working as a Christian therapist, and that's going to be for way beyond 10 years. So absolutely thrilled to be where I am, and... Um, just amazing to see how God has um, just orchestrated our steps, you know, every step along the way. So when we think about communication, you know, we think about all the different things that we do. Some of it is those tuck-in conversations that you have with your kids at night. Um, some of it is the little notes you put in their school boxes. Maybe it's texting back and forth with older children. Maybe it's a family game night. But a million different ways... The heartbeat of the family is expressed in our communication with each other. It is the way we speak to each other back and forth. And scripture has a lot to say about communication, doesn't it? I mean, we can probably, if we think about words and talking, we can think of lots of scriptures about communication. Um, one of the first ones that um, I'm gonna, we're going to look at is James 1.19. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be, who knows it, quick, oh, it's up there too, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So what does this say? Communication is more about listening and understanding than it is about talking. Now, if you're a talker like me, I don't like that because I have to listen and I want to talk, but communication is not about talking. It is about listening and understanding. The heartbeat of God is also expressed in his communication with us through his word. So if the heartbeat of God is expressed through his communication, then that makes sense that the heartbeat of the family is expressed through communication. Let's just pray tonight that the Lord will work on our hearts as we um, hear about this about his communication for us. Father, we thank you so much that your word is true. Lord, that you have changed us, that you have redeemed us. God, in the, even in the areas of talking with each other and the arguments and the frustrations we have, Lord, I pray that tonight as we get some practical steps, you would reveal to us the things in our hearts that we need to change, the, the practical things to move away from and to move into. In Jesus' name, amen. So when you think about, when we talk about communication, we think about different ways that you may think about your mom and dad growing up and how they talk to you. Um, I think now I'm kind of, we're kind of in a sweet spot with our kids. They are so fun. Like sitting at family dinners are exciting. We have a good time. One of the favorite things that we like to do, it's not, not every time, not even maybe weekly, but we really enjoy um, playing an impromptu game of charades. And anytime somebody begins to pretend that they're being somebody, and it has to be somebody in our family, any, right? <laughs> so anytime somebody is being somebody who is really loud, um, overreacting, or um, is, I see I have to check my notes to even talk about myself, um, overreacting or being clumsy, they're pretending they're me. 
It's a lovely thing to have yourself displayed in your kids. But it's exciting to look at um, kind of how, how we interact with each other when it's a positive, fun thing. But when we have communication and when we have relationships growing up that aren't super healthy, it changes the way we communicate. It changes the way we hear things. So um, some of us, or sorry, all of us are doing the best we can with what we have most often, right? Most parents, most spouses are doing the best they can with what they have. But if we grew up and we weren't modeled healthy communication, we weren't modeled um, and interacted with in a healthy way, it can absolutely change the way we interact as we get older and the way that we interact with our children and our spouses now. These patterns are literally imprinted in our brains and they're the fabric of our relationships. They change how we interact with each other. We are hardwired for, inter for um, connection with each other, but connection is scary when it's not healthy. So think about this. Let's say we have Mark and he's married to Nikki. And Mark is asked by Nikki, and I, I will say that all of these examples are fake unless I say that they're specifically real. Um, let's say Mark grew up in a home that his father was verbally abusive. And Mark's father would put him down, make fun of him, tell him he was good for nothing, he couldn't do anything. When he tried to help him, Mark's father would make fun of him. And all Nikki says to him is, Mark, why don't you take out the trash? Instead of a healthy response, as simple as, oh, I forgot, it was too cold, or I was eating another piece of pie. Mark doesn't do that. He looks at Nikki, and he says, he looks at her, and he, he doesn't even talk. He doesn't even say anything. He looks at her, and he goes, hmm, and walks out of the room. Because in his internal dialogue, what is he hearing? He's not hearing why didn't you take out the trash? He's hearing, you can't do anything right, and you're a failure. Now, she's not saying that. So let's suppose that Nikki grew up in a home where her parents weren't, weren't um, present, and they, um, they, were, they didn't interact with her very much, and they ignored her. So when Mark walks out of the room, what is she feeling? See how that works? So it's important for us to learn our, what, our, um, what our parents have taught us, what we've learned from communication, and what that kind of that internal dialogue is. Because my past hinders healthy communication. Where I've come from, what I've been taught, hinders healthy communication. But here's, here's the important thing to remember. That Jesus transforms, absolutely transforms my present into healthy communication. So we can learn where we came from to learn where we're going, which is pretty, a pretty powerful thing. Um, this is how that works. If you have um, a past, well, we all have past, that's tough, right? And you have this dysfunction in your home, and you bring it into your home, and we, we come into the church, and we get saved, or we've grown up in the church, and we still have dysfunction, and then we say, but everything should be okay because I'm a new creation in Christ. But we still have patterns that we have to investigate and learn. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24 says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we don't only do this in our sinful nature, we do this in our patterns and in the way we communicate and in the way that we function in our homes. So it's interesting that scripture completely lines up with what we know in the, in the therapy and psychology world. It's pretty fascinating. Neurologists can actually see in the brain new pathways being formed when you learn to think about things differently. Isn't that pretty incredible? It's pretty fascinating. So 
In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, what does the Lord tell us? He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So if I can look back and recognize the patterns of what I'm thinking about, of, about myself, and I can learn to be created as a new person in Christ, I can take those thoughts captive. And the second thing I can do from Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Now, we're not able to pick our families, are we? No. <laughs> Somebody said that really loud. We are not able to pick our families. We are born into them. But we are able to choose Christ. And we are given lots of wonderful, great things from our families. Some of us are given absolutely powerful lineages in Christ. We are given incredible stories of people who sacrificed for each other, who loved each other, and who raised, I mean, some of us are sitting here that we have generations back that prayed us through, and we are grateful for those things. And we all have positive, and we all have negative. But the important thing is to look at and go, so who has that made me now? How has my past that's been transformed by Christ, how has that made me who I am today? So if we look from our past to our present, the one consistency in all of that is me, right? I'm still the same me, even though I've been transformed by Christ. So my personality helps or hinders my healthy communication. If I understand kind of what those internal dialogues are that I grew up with, and some of them, like I said, are positive, and some of them are negative, then I can look at how my personality helps or hinders that healthy communication. So we're going to look at two ways that personality functions in communication. The first one is to understand what our cycle is. And what I mean by that is the cycle that we have of communication. And we, this can be involved with, with children as well, but typically um, we're looking at how in a spouse or a marriage relationship you interact, but you can apply these principles to your kids and kind of see how, where they are. John Gottman has, is a um, world-renowned um, marriage researcher, and he has a lot of really practical principles for how to recognize when you're being healthy or being destructive in, in a, in a um, communication pattern. So here's what happens. We are either an introvert or an extrovert, right? Most typically. I mean, you can guess I'm an extrovert. Um, so we're either somebody who tends to pursue in a, in a communication or in an um, argument or in frustration. We either tend to pursue or we tend to withdraw. Neither one of those is positive or negative. It is simply my personality. So if I'm a pursuer, what that means is we have to figure this out. We need to know what's going on. We need to talk about where we're going on vacation, and we need to have it all figured out right now, right? And the withdrawer says, I need a little bit of time to think about it. Give me just a breath. I just need to breathe. And the pursuer says, but we need to talk about it. We need to figure it out right now. And I already know five stops we're going to make on the drive there. And I already know exactly where we're going to stay. And as our voices get louder and more intense, I say R because that's me, then the withdrawer is doing what? Getting incredibly overwhelmed. Because God's wired us differently. He has wired us differently. And how many of us know opposites attract? Right? How many of you are married to somebody just like you? No hands. Or even in a really good friendship relationship. Usually our friends are opposite as well. So understanding where I fit in this, in this cycle is really important. So when a pursuer pursues, what they are wanting is a conversation, right? They're wanting to have communication. But what they're not understanding is a withdrawer needs 
like I said, time and space to think and process. So when the pursuer says, where are we going on vacation? Let's talk about it. And the withdrawer goes, ah, ah. you know, like you're, you're, I can't, I can't, I can't. And they move back. Then the pursuer begins to feel rejected and frustrated. And their anxiety often tends to go up. Because nobody's responding to me. I just want to have a conversation. I just want to talk about it. And all you're doing is staring at me. Some of you are grinning at each other. <laughs> um, so then the withdrawer becomes an avoider. So the withdrawer isn't just withdrawing to go, okay, give me some space. They're over here avoiding, and they're like way over here going, la, 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 la. And the pursuer isn't getting what they want. So they're like the bear at the mouth of a cave, and they're becoming an aggressor, and they're going, we need to talk about this right now! Right? And when you get into that, un some of you are really laughing at each other. When you get into that unhealthy cycle, you become an aggressor and an avoider. That's not healthy. That's incredibly unhealthy. We can be pursuers and we can be withdrawers and be healthy because that's how God created us, to balance each other. But when we get into that aggressive, now, 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 or the avoiding, does anything ever happen? No. It doesn't go anywhere. And it works that way with kids, too, because our kids have personalities that are either pursuers or withdrawers. Like I said, those are neither positive or negative. They just are. It's the aggressive and the withdrawing that is negative because then there's no communication happening. So then what do we do? We identify the cycle as the enemy not the person. That's important. We identify the cycle as the enemy, not the person. I have to seek first to understand what you need, not what I need. Remember when Pastor Jeff mentioned in Ephesians this morning that um, it says submit to one another? What that means is who the other person is, that God created them to be, their needs, their desires, their wants, what God has placed in them, not what I need. If I'm a pursuer, I need action and I need commitment and I need talking about it. But what the withdrawer needs me to do is back up and give them time and space. And if I do that, and then they understand what I need, Hopefully, we can come back together and have a healthy communication or a healthy discussion about it. So here's what happens. If you are being um, healthy in this process, the pursuer will say something like, can we have a, conver can we have a conversation about where we're going to go this summer? And the withdrawer will say, instead of nothing, whew, I haven't even thought about it. I need a couple days. Because what the pursuer needs is a verbal commitment. A verbal something, right? Those of you that are thinkers, is that right? When you're a thinker and you, no, sorry, the pursuer, that's what you need, right? You need a verbal commitment. And when you are the withdrawer and you need time to think, sometimes that's even hard. It's hard to say when you're going to come back to the table when you're going to be able to come back and have a conversation about it. But if we both recognize that, that the pursuer needs a verbal commitment, a verbal something, maybe I'll be ready to reevaluate in 20 minutes or a day or two days. Then we can come back and talk about it. That is going to help the pursuer go, okay, now you're still going to have to manage yourself and you're going to have to back up and you're going to have to zip your lips which is hard to do. I know, because I struggle with it, even though I know how to do it. It's not easy. But then the, the withdrawer, if they have their time and space, they're going to feel more safe and free to come back and discuss it, as long as you're not being the bear at the cave screaming and banging on the door. Does that make sense? And it works that way with our kids, kids as well, like I said. If we ask ourselves, 
what do they need from me? And honor that. Not what do I need from you, what do you need from me? Because that is how Jesus served us. That is what Jesus did for us. What do you need from me? He was a servant leader. And if we can transform the way we think about communication, if we can transform the way that we think about um, getting our needs met and recognize that he meets my needs, not necessarily the person next to me, then we can go into the conversation recognizing that I'm here to love you. I'm a conduit for God's love for you. There's a really good book called, um, if you're interested in more of this, there's a really good book called The Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas. And he's, the kind of tagline for the book, he says, um, what if marriage was designed to make us holy, not happy? Hmm. Right? They're not mutually exclusive. We can be holy and happy. But when we go into it, into any relationship, how is this going to make me happy? Then where am I focusing? On my needs, not on what the other person needs. So that was the first one. I'm going to try to wrap up the second one in just a couple minutes. But what is, so what is my cycle? Am I the pursuer? Am I the, am I the withdrawer? And what does the other person need from me? Because I do not want, um, if I'm a loving person, I do not want my spouse or my child to feel like, um, they're getting anxious because I'm not even responding verbally. Or I don't want them to feel overwhelmed and threatened if I'm coming at them hard. Now, I fail at this. But the more we work on it, the better we will be. Um, so asking, what does my spouse need from me or my child? And what does God want? how does God want to love them through me? So the second thing, real quick, is what is my motivation? What is my motivation? I have a really... Um, so check my motivation. If we check our motivation, I have a really, really profound um, quote by someone who's just a really, um, really amazing person, really intellectual. And he says, check your heart all the time. Anybody know who that is? So John Christ, Christian comedian. Um, if anybody follows him on Instagram, he posted the other day that he was getting on an airplane and he didn't have his seatbelt buckled. And the, the stewardess came over and told him, buckle your seatbelt, or reminded him he had to. And he said, the guy behind him leaned forward and said, check your heart. That's kind of, isn't that awesome? So if you know him, that's really funny. If you don't, you need to look him up. He's pretty funny. So am I motivated out of love for others? Or am I motivated out of my personality? If I am a personality, like I said, that's more the withdrawer, it's likely that I am going to be um, more of a peacemaker. I want everything to be peaceful. I'm going to be nice. But nice is not necessarily loving. Nice is people-pleasing and peacemaking at all costs. And if I'm more of a aggressive type person or a pursuing type personality, it may be that I'm motivated out of, um, well, the opposite of nice is just plain mean, sorry. Um, but that's where I am, so in my flesh. <laughs> um, and it's being mean is manipulative and controlling at all costs. And that's where we fall in our flesh, in our personalities. But if we're motivated by love, According to 1 Corinthians 13, there's 16 things that love is and love is not. If I am motivated by love in how I communicate with you, then I'm not going to be nice or mean. I'm going to be loving. And loving sets boundaries. Loving is spirit controlled. Mark 12, 30, 31. I'm going to end here. Mark 12, 30 through 31 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. In the original Greek, this says, as you are being loved yourself. It's a verb tense we don't use very often. It is a um, continuous or present, pro I have to read this really carefully. It is a continuous or present progressive tense. So any of the, the um, you know, English geeks out there like my mother, if she watches this, um, indicate a present and unfinished verb. 
Think about that. As you are being loved yourself indicates present and unfinished. So it's presently happening. I'm being loved myself and it's continuous forever. Who am I being loved by? By God. If I'm loving others as I am being loved myself, and that's my motivation, then it's not going to be to control or change people, and it's not going to be to make, make sure their moods are okay. It's going to be loving. And when we can be centered in that in our homes, we can ask ourselves, how can I communicate God's love? How can I learn to know what they need from me? And when we center it that way, then we are continually a conduit of his love in our communication with each other. Now, it's, it's hard to do it all the time. But the first step is to recognize where am I, where am I weak, and asking the Holy Spirit to help us. Lord, show me, help me to be more spirit-controlled and not nice, not mean, not aggressive, not avoiding, but loving. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are good. God, that you communicate your love to us in perfection. That every story, every example of your love for us, every word spoken in your word is truth and it is grace. And we pray that we would be able to tonight speak truth and grace into our homes, into our children, into our spouses. Just for the next two minutes right before we go, if you are here with your family, if you can just get together with them. Um, if you're here by yourself, team up with a family or a friend. And if we can just pray for each other, what can I do better? How can I communicate more effectively with you? How can we have a loving, guided home that is centered on communicating his love to each other rather than what our needs are? just take a few minutes um, this is your dismissal like I said just a couple minutes and pray out loud for each other if you are the leader of your home and you're here pray over your family pray over your children pray over your um, your spouse pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to be love-centered and grace-centered and not me-centered with each other